This is the Ancient and Medieval History Lecture for Wednesday, the 8th of June, 2022. And we are happy that all of the people in here turned in their textbooks yesterday so that I don't have to downgrade you. You all got A pluses in a homework assignment. That's a lot more than I thought. Yeah, and they're not all in because other classes were not as diligent as you. Ah, uh, okay. That's the right side. So, we have finished talking about the um, effects of the Black Death, and we're now working our way towards the culmination of the Middle Ages, uh, the late Middle Ages. And let us talk about tensions within the church. These tensions include a papacy that has tried and tried again to be the dominant force in European politics. The dream of uh, Unum Sanctum and, later, uh, and of Innocent III was of a Christian commonwealth, of Christendom and something more than just name, of a Christendom that was a set of states under the Pope, united by not only a broad set of Judeo-Christian values, sort of like the Greek city-states were, but also united by a regulatory pope who can manage the interactions between the kings of Europe to prevent war and to coordinate the resources of Christian Europe to better defend Europe against the Muslims and maybe even counterattack and drive the Muslims back and do other things that are in the common good. That was the dream. It wasn't simply of an independent church. It was a church that could dominate the state. And there were times, like at Canossa, when this happened. But the church is an institution, while may be inspired by God, believers believe, the church is an institution which is staffed by men. And as such, the church is subject to the same sorts of venality and corruption that affect all other human political institutions. So there are people within the church who will sell out the church for their own personal gain. Just like there are Americans within the United States who will sell out their country for their own personal gain. It's a nasty form of corruption. Also, the church, for all of its power, doesn't have an army. And not having an army, that means that the state powers can dominate it. I, I'll, I'll correct that. The church does have the pope's army. The pope's army is about the size of any other central or north Italian army, which is small, not, not able to stand up to the French or, or to the Holy Roman Empire if there's a serious attack most of the time. So this is what the church has been doing during the Black Death. As the climate has cooled and made life harsher, as um, people are suffering. Not that that would ever... No, no, no. Tempted to talk about the stupid propaganda piece that's going to be appearing on, I think, ABC in a few nights, where a bunch of Democrats got an ABC television producer to produce a documentary on the January 6th insurrection. So while gas prices rise and the cost of living rises because of inflation, which is rising, 10,000 migrants heading towards the border in one big caravan, uh, Putin and Ukraine, and a bunch of other things going on, this is what they choose to focus on. Not that that would ever happen. I was talking to my dad about the gas prices, and he said he can't believe like the rate they're going at, especially for like, drivers who have to pay for their own gas. Yeah. Um, he can't believe the rate is going in. Because when he got gas, he would just have to scrape quarters out of his car yeah. and just pay for it, and that'd be fine. Yeah. And here I am paying $50 just to fill up my tank. Yeah, that's crazy. And you've got to pay for insurance and a bunch of other things as well. No. Um, and the thing is, uh, in 2019, we were exporting oil. So something happened hmm, between 2019 and 2021 when this all started. I think you can figure out 
various things for yourself. I'm not going to say it. I've already been a little self-indulgent. But the point is, people are suffering. And a lot of people who are suffering that have looked to the church are not finding a church that's engaged with their kinds of problems. They're finding an imperial church, an imperial papacy, a pope that is trying much more to compete with and over-dominate the kings than he is trying to, to tend to the pastoral needs of the people of God, which is a fancy way of saying the church seems to be more political than in the business of helping people who are in need, religiously, spiritually, and even in terms of charity. So there are new tendencies within the church that are going to arise. For example, I keep grabbing the wrong notes. Um, there is a new form, a new piety that seems to be driving a lot of people. Now, piety is from the Latin word pietas, which means loyalty to one's father. But what it really means in terms of religion is a personal commitment to live a life accountable to God, in dedication to God, a life that is more holy than it might otherwise be. That's piety. So a person who reads the Bible, a person who prays, not because they have to, but because they choose to, a person who, when they see somebody in need, will turn aside like the Good Samaritan and offer help if they can, unless you're in a city, in which case that's probably a scam, stay the hell away. I'm from New York, I'm telling you, do not walk up to a street person anywhere and offer help because you are volunteering to be victimized. Um, there may be exceptions. If you're with people, different story. So remember St. Francis of Assisi, a wealthy, well-to-do fellow who ends up dedicating his life to serving the poor with his own hands to healing, healing animals with his own hands. That's a form of piety. A person says, I'm not living for money anymore. I'm not living for family status anymore. I'm not trying to acquire wealth or power anymore. I'm going to live a life of service. And I'm not going to live a life of service isolated in a monastery somewhere. I'm going to live a life of service on the streets of our cities trying to help people in need. So Francis of Assisi does exactly what I told you just not to do. He spends his time and his followers, the Franciscan friars, spend their time personally caring for the needs of the poor. The poor of spirit, the poor of body. As much as I've maligned or spoken harshly of the Cathari and the Albigensians, um, what motivates them is good. Much like communists today, or the kind of theoretical anarchists that never actually spent any time in a poor neighborhood, it's well-intentioned. The belief of many ideological Marxists, academic socialists, is if only the world was more organized in a more just and righteous fashion, most poverty could be eliminated. It's not a question of having enough food. It's a question of distributing it properly. It's not a question of having enough wealth. It's a question of redistributing it. Now, I don't think their answers ever work, but they're not evil in the sense of self-understanding, self-intentional destructiveness. They want to help. God help us when we're faced with people who only want to help you. Because sometimes their ideas of what will help you will hurt you. Sometimes good intentions aren't enough. But I absolutely acknowledge that for most people involved in the Cathari movement and movements like it, they are well-intentioned. They want to make the world a better place. Much like people today who are behind a bunch of woke ideas and a bunch of conservative ideas. Most people don't step out of their quiet life into controversy for fun. They do it because they think they have something that will help other people. An idea, 
a way of doing things, something like that. So that, oddly enough, the Cathari and the Albigensian Crusade, were on the, by the way, on item K, tensions increase within the church, one new piety, B and C, Cathari and the Albigensians, that's part of it. The Dominicans, they start with good intentions. And largely, the Dominicans have good intentions outside of the Inquisition. Because the Dominicans are dedicated to what? To teaching. To teaching theology and religious philosophy that is, and Bible studies, which is rooted in the church's wisdom. So, for example, I kind of understand this, since I'm foolish enough to have dedicated my life to teaching. I believe that teaching people truly and well, to the best of my ability, is going to be good for you, and it's going to be good for the world. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe everything I've done has added to the pain and misery on this planet. But my intentions are good. I also try to make sure that what I do with those intentions is good. Some people think that good intentions alone are enough. They're not. You gotta have good intentions, but you've also gotta watch the effects of what you do. And if the effects of what you do are bad, maybe you wanna rethink it. Oh God, people hate rethinking their ideas. They really do. They don't wanna rethink their ideas once they've come to them. They wanna defend them. The Dominicans are set up to prevent the kind of ideological mistakes that led to the Albigensian Crusade and a bunch of other bloodbaths that bring about peasant uprisings. It's not that the Dominicans are unaware of the suffering in the world. They're quite aware. They just don't think that burning down the houses of the rich and uh, beating the rich to death and taking their property is necessarily the way to paradise. So there's a desire upon, uh, among many religious people to move away from a political imperial church towards a church that encourages devotion in one's private life by giving a person who believes opportunities to do charity, to do good works, to live from an active basis of love, whatever that means. We've talked about Boniface the Seventh's Unum Sanctum. We've talked about the Avignon Papacy. We talked about the Great Schism, where you have eight different people claiming to be Pope and calling the other seven anti-Pope and anti-Christ. We've just flipped the page. If you're following me in your notes, which you should be. Uh, where are we? It looks like national divisions, but I gotta make sure because great schism. Okay, four. No, that's not. Ah, we're looking for L. J K L. No, that's going backwards. I I am so zapped this morning. I don't see an L. There isn't an L. Okay, yeah, it, we are at national divisions. So uh, K A. <laughs> I screwed that up. Uh, national divisions. Uh, you have a French church, a uh, German church. You have the 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 rise of these national churches. You also have repetitions of the Albigensian Crusades and peasant wars. For example, in France, you have what's called the Jacquerie, which is a peasant uprising against the nobility. It's not here, but it's listed later in your notes. You also have John Wycliffe in England, who begins to say that the church as it's structured is not biblical. biblical. The church as it's structured is not oriented towards the words of Christ. Wycliffe spreads his ideas through writings, but it's before the age of the printing press. 
so some of his students get away from England in time, and some of his books get away from England in time and spread to, among other places, the Czech lands. Wycliffe is burned at the stake as a heretic. His ideas are put away. In Bohemia, which is the Czech lands, Jan Hus takes up Wycliffe's call in what is called the Lollard movement, or Lollardy. This idea that the church should move away from a hierarchical structure towards uh, and away from politics towards a more pastoral structure, that the church should stop supporting the nobles. And this leads to what are known as the Hussite Wars. The Hussite Wars are probably the bloodiest peasant uprising of the Middle Ages. It goes on for years, and the Czech lands in uh, the center of Europe uh, become the heart of this fight much like the Albigensians, to destroy the order that the Middle Ages has, where you are what your daddy does, and God and his church are at the center of all things, and to replace it with something else. But the Hussite Wars quickly become a eat-the-rich, anti-wealth, anti-power thing, and ultimately they fail, most bloodily. You know what ends... The Great Schism? A council. A church council is called. And this council has representatives from all over the world. Not the popes, exactly. Not the kings, exactly. But the church, all over the, all over the Christian world, sends representatives to a council. And there are representatives of the kings there, and representatives of the various popes. And here's the solution. The church council is going to say every current pope must step away, must resign, abdicate, gone. A new conclave will be held. The national kings will keep their mitts off. And the pope is going to be back in Rome. This is a return to the church as it was before the Avignon papacy and before the great schism. And it works. So now we have one pope again in Rome, and we have a bunch of kings, and that's better. But then somebody gets the idea, hey, if church councils can solve the problem of the Great Schism, maybe they can replace the pope. Maybe the pope should have a, a big church council every 10 to 20 years. Maybe the church councils should be the real decision makers, and the Pope should sort of be a figurehead between councils. To which the Pope say, nope, we're not doing that. God did not make a church council. God made the Vicar of Christ, Peter, uh, and his successors have special authority. So conciliarism, which is a vocab term, conciliarism is the belief that church councils can replace the Pope. It fails. Conciliarism is the belief that church councils can replace the Pope. This movement fails. Okay. Now we shift to item E. Post-plague pop prosperity. Um, in the short term, there are some problems, because about 50 years after the plague, there's an attempt to put people back in their place. In France, as I said, there's the Jacquerie, which is a peasant uprising against authority, which is crushed. In England, you've got the Watt Tyler Rebellion. Watt Tyler is a guy. He's a peasant. His name is Watt Tyler. Good Watt. Mm, not many people named Watt these days. Good. Anyway, Watt Tyler ends up confronting an English king over issues of wealth until he's killed. Uh, and like um, other peasant uprisings, both the Jacquerie and the Watt Tyler revolt are plagued by having people who are not well educated at the leadership. People who are passionate but not well educated do not make good policy when it comes to rebellion. They usually make stupid, preventable mistakes, and they fail. Also, you have a number of cities 
who are resisting the idea of being part of the kingdom. A lot of cities want to be basically run their own affairs. And they run their own affairs because the kings and nobles don't really understand city folk or city like life. The noble system is set up to run the countryside. So cities usually have independent charters where the cities are loyal to the king. They're part of the king's land. But for the most part, the king keeps his mitts off the cities and the cities uh, send their taxes to the king and that's everyone's happy. But as the Middle Ages comes to a close, a number of European kings are trying to increase their tax revenue, increase their power, and decrease the number of alternative power, powers that there are within their kingdom. So a number of the city charters, which for hundreds of years have allowed cities to basically run themselves, are changed by the kings or eliminated by the kings entirely in order to give the king greater influence over city government and city life. This causes a series of urban uprisings. Sometimes the uprisings uh, completely fail. Sometimes the uprisings fail, but the king backs off a little bit. Depends on the time and place. But understand that one of the power plays going on is for kings to try to get more power over the cities and the cities resisting. For the nobles to try to get control of the peasants again and the peasants resisting. Okay, let me go through item B, C, D, E, F, G, and H quickly, just uh, as they're written. In the West, during the late Middle Ages, fully one person in three dies from the Black Death. This shook society to its core, disturbing control and loyalty exerted by both governments and church. The labor of the survivors became more valuable, improving conditions for the peasants and the urban laborer. The survivors tended to dramatically increase their wealth by appropriating the vast properties left by the dead. This extra money was one often invested in new businesses, jump-starting the European economy. This is the lighter fluid images that we were talking about yesterday. Trade organizations. Ah, the Hanseatic League. Underline that. The Hanseatic League. This is in item uh, E, post plague prosperity. One, affects the economy. B, long term. No, no. Uh, e, E is trade organizations such as the Hanseatic League. The Hanseatic League is an association of cities around the Baltic and North Seas. So the Hanseatic League includes places like Lübeck in North Germany and Danzig in North Germany and Poland and basically a bunch of cities in a variety of different countries around the Baltic and around the North Sea. And what these cities do as part of the Hanseatic League is they form a trade zone a free tr a trade area. What that means is, if Golubiewski is trying to ship beer from Poland to Sweden, or to, uh, from Poland uh, to uh, uh, Holland, because of course the Dutch don't make enough beer, um, what he can do is bring his beer to the city of Danzig. Danzig is part of the German area, but it also has strong connections to Poland. And by paying all of your, your, your taxes in Danzig and getting inspected in Danzig, when it's shipped from Danzig to another Hanseatic city, anywhere around the Baltic or the North Sea, when it, when it arrives, it's not gonna have much trouble. Normally when goods arrive in a city, from a foreign land, they're closely inspected. You've got to pay a bunch of import taxes, and maybe you have to keep it in storage for a while for all of this to happen. But if you're shipping from Danzig, a Hanseatic city, you are going to not have to worry about that. Because within the Hanseatic League, trade is encouraged. So if one city certifies that the goods have been paid for and inspected, when you arrive at your destination, you're going to have much less trouble. So, the kinds of difficulties that would normally exist in international trade that cost people more money and time 
and resources just to do business are much less of a problem within the Hanseatic League. So the Hanseatic League is something that spurs the wealth of the member cities and of the people within those member cities. So the Hanseatic League is an association of cities designed to improve trade, and it works. It's not a political association. It's not about empire. It's not about messing with the different cities' relationships to the hinterland, to their kingdoms. It's about trade, money, trade, money, and trade, and money. So this sort of thing is becoming more common. It's also one of the things the cities argue when the kings try interfering with them. What they say is, hey, your majesty, but they don't say hey. They say, your majesty, we respectfully point out that if you change things within our city, our membership within the Hanseatic League might be nullified. And all of the wealth that you expect to be generated here will be put into doubt. Because if we're no longer a member of the Hanseatic League, we no longer can guarantee the level of trade that, and commerce that we have had up till now. So, item E. Trade organizations such as the Hanseatic League on a large scale and urban trade guilds on a small scale shape private economic activity. Uh, this is activity irrespective of government's intent or policy. Banking. This is a huge deal. If I want to start a business, let me pick a business that is very likely to fail. A restaurant. I want to start a restaurant. More than 50% of the restaurants fail within their first year in normal times, it's worse now, uh, because they're undercapitalized. They, have, they don't have enough money to function. So I'm going to start a restaurant that specializes in Puerto Rican dessert dishes, particularly flan. Flan is sort of an egg custard dish with um, cinnamon uh, and vanilla. It's tasty. So I'm going to set up a dessert place um, based on flan and based on uh, Caribbean coffee. And so I need money because while I have the desire to do this, I, I don't have the money lying around. So how am I going to get the money to start my business, to start my restaurant? Well, I need to get investors. And maybe I can convince a few of you to take your hard-earned money and give it to me in return for a share of the profits and a share of the ownership of the business. That's a common business deal. You become shareholders or stockholders. I run the business. I have to account for you in terms of keeping things profitable. Uh, you don't have to do anything other than contribute your money. Uh, and I will try not to lose it. Now, it's a gamble. It's a gamble because if my business doesn't attract enough customers to become self-supporting within the first six months or nine months or a year, I'm going out of business and your money is, there it goes, it's gone. It was a gamble. You took a risk on my business and it fails. Or if I succeed, you begin to get dividends, which is a share of the profits, which is a good reason to invest. But you've got to be careful with your investments. There's another way I can get financed, though. I can go to a money lender, otherwise known as a bank, and I can pr present my business plan to the bank and ask them to loan me the money for my business. Now, I have to put something up as collateral, something that's valuable, something that's about equivalent in value to the loan I'm taking out. So if it's, no, not a child, if it's not worth that much. If I have, um, if, if I inherited uh, an apiary, which is a, a bee ranch, uh, where I have honeybees and, and I, I, I have honey, so I've already got a business, but I now want to expand that business into this restaurant, what I can do is put the apiary up as collateral. And if I can't pay the loan back, the bank gets my apiary. And then I, when I think of APR, I think it should be have, you know, having chimpanzees and orangutans and gorillas, but nobody listens to me. Um, 
The bank gets all that. What if I don't have an APR? What if I don't have collateral? It's much harder to get a loan. Now we come to the inevitable anti-Semitism of it all. Why would you loan me money if you're a bank or if you're a person? The Bible says that loaning money at interest is sinful. So if I borrow 10,000 crowns, gold crowns, for my business from you, I am to pay you back 10,000 crowns. So there's no incentive for you to loan me the money because all you're doing is an act of charity. You're loaning me 10,000 crowns. I pay you back 10,000 crowns. You've got your money back. But that's not profit. You've done something generous. Bankers are not in business to be generous. So the way you make it sweet, if I'm going to borrow 10,000 gold crowns, I promise to pay you back with interest. And what that means, and I'm not going to go into the warrant of detail that is compound interest, I end up paying you back in five years, not 10,000 crowns, but between 15 and 18,000 crowns. I am paying you back what you loaned me, plus interest, extra money to reward you for trusting me with your 10,000 gold. That interest is why bankers loan money, because it's a profitable business. And if they loan money to somebody that puts up collateral and the person can't pay it back, they get to have the collateral and sell it on the open market and make money. It's all about improving your supply of money. That's what bankers do. But Christians in the Middle Ages are not allowed to be bankers. The word usury, U-S-U-R-Y, is there in those notes. Usury is a mortal sin, according to the medieval Christian church in the West. The medieval Catholic church says that if you loan money and interest, you are engaged in an evil act. You are profiting off of other people's desperate need, and you are predating upon them. You're acting like a predator. You're treating other people like prey. You're gobbling up their hopes and dreams. So Christians in the Middle Ages can't go into banking because A, if they're believers, their soul is consigned to eternal hellfire, and B, even if they don't believe, their customers will, and nobody is going to openly do business with somebody whose soul is consigned to eternal hellfire. So who does this leave? Who does this leave who lives in Europe and who um, isn't Christian and therefore can engage in banking, which depends upon loaning money at interest? Tell me. I'm getting the dice. Because this is an obvious... Actually, no. I want the class to tell me. Three, two, one. Jews. Jews. Yep. Jewish people. Jewish people, they can be bankers, and they become bankers. They become the bankers of medieval Europe. They loan money at interest. It's no big deal to them, because they don't have a religious code that damns them to eternal hellfire. Now, how does this affect relations between Jews and Christians? Are people grateful when they get helped? Do people kiss the hand that feeds them? Think about it. People bite the hand that feeds them. Because we're perverse, nasty creatures in some respects. We don't like going hat in hand. Excuse me, Mr. Rubenstein. Can I please have a loan? Explain why. And then you've got to account for yourself. People resent that unfairly. It's like dumb-bottomed idiots who get jobs with people who then hate their bosses for being stupid enough to hire them. If you don't like your job, get another one. I've done it. Oh, but that's scary. Yep. But at least you're not stuck in a poisonous situation where every day you go into work, you hate your boss and you do your job intentionally poorly just to pay your boss back. Again, for being stupid enough to hire you in the first place. You are not owed a living. 
Your boss doesn't owe you a job. And if you don't like or respect your job or your boss, you owe it to yourself to leave. But I have encountered truly poisonous, hateful people who've become more poisonous and hateful because they stay in jobs they absolutely despise. They stay there. And they are nasty centers of anger and wrath and controversy. And it's lousy. In any event, because Jews are the bankers of Europe, there's incentive to have a pogrom. Because if you have a pogrom and your Jewish bankers business is burned to the ground, the records that prove that you owe him money go up in flames. So you don't have to pay him anymore. Burn down a bank every time you owe money. Or, sometimes, God. or you can, during the pogrom, break into his house or his business and loot his treasury. So he's stupid enough to loan you money, you help instigate a pogrom, you destroy the records that you owe him money, and you take your money back. Or you take his money away from him. And all in the name of killing Christ killers. Or making Christ killers pay. Because the, the deepest hateful, evil lie that anti-Semites tell about Jews is that they're all Christ killers. Yes, people born hundreds or thousands of years after Christ was crucified are damned as being the murderers of Jesus Christ. Because of a line in the Bible that has Jewish leaders say, yes, we take this, uh, we take this act upon ourselves and upon our descendants to the last generation. That's not righteous. That's not any righteous according to Jewish or Christian uh, theology. But yeah, people use it. Because people sometimes are lousy, hateful people, beings. And it doesn't take much of an excuse to be a lousy, hateful person in the right circumstances. But in the late Middle Ages, the church has a change of heart. And the church permits Christians to begin banking. So you end up with two Christian houses of banking. You end up with... i got to be really careful. The... Fuggers! <laughs> F-U-G-G-E-R-S. The Fuggers. With their founder, Jakob Fugger. So the Fuggers are the bankers of Northern Europe. They are the Christian bankers of the Holy Roman Emperor, among others. And, in addition to the Fuggers... You've got the house, well, you've got the Medici. The Medici are from Florence, and they obviously start out as a family of healers, because that's what their name means. But the De Medici clan ends up going big time into banking. And this banking is going to make them powerful, and next fall you'll learn about the Medici in Florence and how they use their power for the benefit, among other things, of art. But the Medici and the Fuggers are the great bankers of Europe because the church has changed its mind. Oh, they still call usury, which is the loaning of money of inter at interest. That's what usury is. You'll need to know that. The loaning of money at interest. At interest. That's usury. They still call usury a sin, but it's no longer a mortal sin. It's a venal sin. That's a lesser sin. It's like a misdemeanor compared to a felony. Felonies are things like kidnapping and murder. Uh, misdemeanors are things like jaywalking, speeding. So there's a difference in quality. Most bankers are willing to commit venal sin, misdemeanor sin, uh, in order to do their job. So we see things that are sparking wealth in Europe. Uh, let's see. Now let's look at military technology. In the High Middle Ages, the Armored Knight is the, the, the king of battle. And stone castles, which are really tall, are reliable fortresses. The Welsh longbowmen challenge the knights. We've talked about all of that. 
Another group that challenges the knights are called Swiss pikemen. Now, a pike is a thick, heavy spear, about four times as thick as this shaft here. It's big and heavy. It's like a little tree trunk. It's like a really thick sarissa, which is the big spear of the uh, Alexander the Great Army. In fact, the pikemen are a return to the Greek phalanx, where you have armies of infantry spearmen. Now, the way the pikemen fight is it's rather interesting. They march across a battlefield, and they take a position. They'll place the butt of their pike into the ground and put their back foot on it. The front foot is protecting their position. And with their hand, they're going to guide this. Now, this is 10, 12, 14, 15 feet long. And if you have three or four lines of pikemen doing this, you've got a hedge of spikes. Now, why this, do you think they stick their butt of the spike into the ground? Why do you think they... Yes? So that if something hits it, it goes into the ground and won't like, dodge too much? Horse charges pike. Horse or horsemen are impaled on the pike. The pike doesn't go slide, 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 slide. The pike is grounded. So the pike penetrates the armor, penetrates the horse, and maybe what happens is the horse and rider actually go flip up, and then the pike breaks. And hopefully the guy who's holding the pike runs back, because you don't want to be crushed by an armored knight. These pikemen could also attack by forming, again, a Greek-style phalanx, and you've got this, hedge, you know, this hedgehog of, of, of heavy spikes moving in, moving in, moving in, and then just before the point of contact, wapu, bam, and anyone who hits them are impaled. So the Swiss pikemen are also something that is going to drive the medieval knight out of supremacy. But now we come to it. The Mongols bring Chinese fireworks to battle at the Battle of Seijo River. They use rockets to try to damage and scare the Europeans, and it works. And what the Europeans do is they get a hold of some of this stuff, and they figure it out. They reverse engineer it. So now the Europeans have gunpowder. Now, the Chinese and the Asians have had gunpowder for hundreds of years by the time Europe gets it. But Europe is more warlike than Asia. In Asia, primarily, fireworks are used for ceremony, like we have 4th of July. Ooh! Ah! I love the ones that go... Those are cool. I like the ones that explode twice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, those are, those are really cool. I mean, some fireworks are just incredible. But what the Europeans do is they start developing these tubes. So you've got a tube which has an open end and a closed end, and it's made of brass or bronze or iron, and you've got a little hole back here, and on top of the hole you've got a little disc, uh, a little bowl called a flash pan. Now, what you do is you take the combination of saltpeter, charcoal, and, oh, uh, what's the third thing? Sulfur. Sulfur. Thank you. You take the saltpeter, charcoal, and sulfur mix, which is which we call gunpowder, and you wrap it up in a paper wad. And the paper wad with the gunpowder goes back here. And then in front of the paper wad, you take a object it could be a stone, it could be a clay ball, eventually it becomes iron balls or brass balls. We call it a musket ball. Right there. Now, if you've built this strong enough, if you use the right amount of gunpowder, what you have with an archivist or a matchlock, which are early firearms, I'll do the matchlock because I know it better. What you've got is um, you've got a hinge here that's attached to a slow match. A slow match is a piece of rope or, uh, 
dipped in, among other things, human liquid waste, that is going to smolder and continue burning even in foggy conditions like we have today. And you keep moving the slow match forward so it's in the hinge. When it comes time to present your fire locks in the direction of the enemy and fire, you attach the smoldering slow match to this bowl, which you have filled with gunpowder. This is called the flash pan. So the slow match goes into the flash pan, and there's a psh, because the gunpowder is highly flammable. Now that psh goes through a little hole here and touches the wad of gunpowder, which then goes boom now. Ah. Nature is lazy. Explosion happens when you have something suddenly take up much more time to the space than it otherwise did. You have powder, it's gunpowder. It explodes because when it ignites, suddenly there is a consumption of air and air pressure, which is going to take up much more space than the powder did. There's one direction that has give, and that's the direction that has the musket hole. So the pressure does not explode the weapon unless you've screwed up somehow. Instead, it shoves this musket ball out of the barrel of the gun somewhere in a cone because musket balls are notoriously inaccurate. Now, the thing about a musket ball, the thing you need really to understand, is musket balls are moving so fast that they'll punch through almost any body armor. A longbow is going to have trouble piercing body armor beyond a certain range. So will a musket ball. But musket balls are much more effective. So you've got an armored knight on a horse, I'm untakeable, boom! Because until the 20th century in Kevlar, we don't really develop body armor that's proof against bullets. And this isn't even like a bullet. You're getting like a fist-sized hole in your chest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It just rips through. Yeah. And because an average musket ball is reduced to the size of a half inch. That's what the old British brown vest used to use. It used to use a half-inch diameter musket ball. So it's bigger than modern bullets, unless you're using a really big gun. Now, let's expand the same principle. So the knights are now just big targets, if the gunmen can do their job. What about castles? The thing about castles, the thing you need to understand is they're made of th stone walls about 10 or 20 feet thick. If you have cannons... You can blast through that in a few days, maybe even sooner. So castles suddenly become big targets. They're not good for fortresses anymore. There's going to need to be a new kind of fortress developed for the Gunpowder Age. This is all called the Gunpowder Revolution, and it begins to happen at the end of the Middle Ages. Tomorrow, the last lesson of the year! <laughs> Thank you. Come again. It is, but I'll hopefully have...